our next speaker is uh, Chen Weihua, uh, who is the uh, EU bureau chief of the China Daily Newspaper, which is published in English, as most of you will know. Uh, and he has previously served as um, a chief Washington correspondent for the same newspaper, for the US edition, rather, of China Daily. So uh, Chen, Wei, Chen Weihua, please, uh, it's, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Desai. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting me and give me the honor to speak at today's events. I first want to congratulate Carlos for the accomplishment of publishing the book, The East is Still Red. Mm -hmm. And also I want to thank Carlos for the very strong support to China against the old, I would say China haters, the vicious Cold War and hot war, warmongers, you know, in their reckless attempt to smear China and contain China. And uh, whether, you know, I think uh, Carlos has been very active on Twitter, in articles and speeches. And I just want to make uh, uh, several quick points. I think the book is very timely because it provides a valuable food for thought. Uh, when people, some people are debating whether China is uh, still a socialist country or how much it still is. If you talk to different people, of course, you may get di very different answers and analysis. I think uh, Carlos's book has provided a very strong argument that China is still a socialist country, you know, after the launch of reform and opening up uh, drive in 1978. And some of the measures, of course, are regarded by some as unorthodox, you know, uh, by some socialist country. But I think uh, using the many analysis and the data from, uh, say, poverty elevation to ecological civilization, I think uh, Carlos' book has shown that, uh, you know, the Chinese government is a government that is people-centered and has delivered greatly to the 1.4 billion people. Actually, I, you know, I am, you know, I stationed uh, many years in the US too. I, I have uh, lots of contact with the China experts in the West, in the in US or Europe. Actually, most of them admit that the Chinese government, uh, you know, despite things they did, uh, disagree, I mean, the Chinese government is known for under promise, but over deliver. And the achievement in China is uh, phenomenal and uh, nothing short of a miracle as someone, you know, who, <laughs> uh, from China. Uh, China is the second largest economy in the world, the largest uh, actually uh, several years ago already in terms of PPP, purchasing power parity, uh, the faster rising living standards. I mean, if you look at the Chinese travelers abroad, uh, Chinese student, students studying abroad and many paying their own tuition you know, by family, their family, the faster growing life expectancy that actually rivals many industrialized nations, including the United States and the advance in science and technology, education, et cetera. In a sense, the success story of China means that the past of socialist country should not be dogmatic. Rather, it should evolve with the times and meet the needs of the population. In China's case, it's called the socialism with Chinese characteristics, as Carlos uh, you know, mentioned many times in the book. It means that a social system fit for the Chinese people, and it will evolve further and be even better for the people. And that, I think, is a very healthy mindset, uh, you know, that uh, uh, very practical, I would say, um, down to earth instead of uh, just empty rhetoric. And the other point I want to make is that, uh, you know, I'm already said the socialism with Chinese characteristics. Uh, I think a socialism has never been experimented in a country with, you know, as large as China, which has a fifth of humanity. You know, uh, I, I always uh, say, I mean, the first thing to understand China is to understand what means a country of a fifth of humanity because the other country with the same size population as India. And, uh, it's, uh, you know, an incredible, incredible challenging job if you are running a country. I mean, in the U.S., I mean, they talk about how tough is running a country of 330 million 
people, right? I mean, so how about Belgium, where I'm stationed, the population 11 million, which is half of my city, Shanghai, or France, the population 60 million, like uh, Hunan or Zhejiang, but only half of the population of Guangdong province. I mean, they also think that learning their country is tough. And how about a country the size of China? I would say, I mean, if you run, think running, having a one child is, Raising one child is uh, difficult. How about in China's case, it's not raising one child. It's more like a raising um, 50 children or 150 maybe. Yeah. So that's uh, something people always need to bear in mind that when they study, talk about China. Because uh, the, often the rhetoric in the West, it's, uh, they all believe, I mean, a lot of people pretend to be China specialists. They think it's uh, just, uh, you know, a piece of cake to fix the problem in China, <laughs> where, you know, they don't understand it's a home of a fifth of humanity. I mean, it's uh, every province, every county is like a country in Europe in size. So I, I want to say Carlos' observation and analysis is very useful uh, to the Chinese themselves, uh, myself included, because the Chinese saying goes that, uh, I mean, the. Uh, I just literally translated, there was a famous scenic mountain called the Lusan. Actually, if you study Chairman Mao, it was a famous Lusan meeting. But if uh, the saying goes that like, if you are actually inside the uh, Lusan, you cannot uh, uh, see Lusan clearly. You know, it's uh, almost like the spectators uh, see uh, the match more clearly than the players themselves on the field. Uh, so. I think, uh, you know, uh, Carlos uh, observation as a non Chinese, I mean, uh, will be very valuable, actually, when I posted uh, the book launch uh, on my WeChat, uh, you know, a moment, uh, you know, one of my uh, friend, colleague, a senior editor in Beijing asked immediately where she can get the book. So it's obviously Chinese are very interested to know how, you know, uh, uh, and someone, you know, from based in UK uh, studying uh, China socialism and expert on that uh, uh, could uh, provide a valuable food for thought for Chinese. I mean, they are eager, I think. I mean, that, I think uh, one of the uh, strong feature in China in the last 45 years uh, is their uh, eager to learn from the outside world. Uh, and uh, fourth, I want to quickly say that uh, uh, I think uh, China, uh, Carlos made a strong argument that China is not an imperialist country or neo-colonialist country, some Western politician like to say. I mean, I, the Chinese, uh, I would say, uh, you know, I don't think any Chinese would want China to become remotely like an imperialist country because of the bitter, bitter memory they have of being oppressed and exploited by the imperialist country, if you point to, you know. Uh, so I think uh, uh, China regards itself as a developing nation that is being a oppressed and exploited by the Western power. And China has learned its lesson and made achievements in the last decades. And I very much hope that uh, other developing countries in the global South especially can replicate some of the success while avoiding the mistakes that China has made in the last uh, four and a half decades. And because you see, and very interesting, Carlos mentioned Ethiopia. I was in Ethiopia 2014. See, actually, the construction of the light rail and the railway to Djibouti. I mean, so all the Eastern Industrial Park where Chinese hope to help in, uh, Ethiopia industrialize because China see Indo Ethiopia as sort of a China in the 1970s that got greater potential to living people out of poverty, lifting people out of poverty, raising the living standards of Ethiopian people. So I think a China, that's a Chinese optimism, not just for Ethiopia, but for Africa, many developing countries. That's, I think, China's genuine. I, I mean, growing up in, in the 
uh, in the mouse days, I, I mean, see African as a brothers. I mean, that's how, you know, I would grow up with. Uh, and uh, fifth, uh, probably the last I want to say is that uh, China world is uh, really facing the great, great uh, change, uh, challenges. I mean, the Cold War and the even Hot War uh, provocation by the United States and uh, its uh, puppet states, I would say. And uh, so, Carlos' book uh, is very useful to help uh, people understand China in the 21st, uh, 21st century. And, uh, you know, given the unprecedented propaganda campaign launch, launched by the U.S. And uh, it's not hard to tell the hyster hysteria if you just look at the U.S. Uh, uh, President Joe Biden's nonsense uh, just a few days ago. You know, I think uh, there was a lot of, I would say, like a Nazi type hate speech on China by say Republican presidential candidates, you know, as they geared up for August 27 debate. I mean, if you just check Nick Haley's uh, tweets, I mean, it's uh, he tweets more hate speech on definitely. China than he arguing things about the United States. Yes, in conclusion, uh, uh, thank you very much, Carlos, for the good job done. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to hear uh, the panel's uh, discussion. And I think uh, uh, Chinese people are very eager for your advice too. Thank you very much. I'm Michael Hudson. I'm appearing here for the International Manifesto Group. If you like this video and want to like it, please subscribe. For more information, go to the address on the screen.